Welcome to the Psychedelia Podcast, where we talk about the third wave of psychedelics. Through our many wide-ranging conversations with scientists, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and event organizers, we bring you an exclusive look into the many minds of the psychedelic world. It's time to let the word out about psychedelics and how they can be used as tools to benefit both the individual and the community. Welcome to the third wave. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the third wave podcast. I'm your host, Paul Austin, and I'm excited for a last third wave podcast. Well, sort of. So basically what we're going to do is this will be the last podcast that we publish for about a month. So we're going to take all of September off. And that's basically to step back and get some clarity on what's going well with the podcast, what's not going so well, and how we can improve the podcast so that it is a gold standard in podcasting. The whole reason I started this podcast was to see if there was a desire for this type of information. If people wanted to listen to the stories and the information that exists in the minds of so many different individuals around psychedelic substances. And this is why I've interviewed such a wide range of people. And I think, you know, we've now confirmed that there's definitely a need and a desire for this sort of podcast. So now that we've understood that, I want to take a step back. I don't want to make this, like I said, a gold standard in podcasting. So this means looking at how we can change the intro music and the outro music. So if you're listening to this and you think you have an excellent intro or outro that you could contribute, please email me, paul at the thirdwave.co and let me know. I might be happy to take a look and a listen uh, to any samples you have. It also includes improving the audio quality. So I've done a few podcasts with people in public places. So for example, I did a podcast with Mark Manson in a breather room in New York that had a bunch of construction right outside. So the audio quality really wasn't all that great. So I want to make sure that our audio quality every time is super high. And I also really want to get the word out to more people. Um, Right now, we're doing pretty well with the podcast. Um, We have about maybe between 1,500 and 2,000 listeners on a consistent basis And I want to get that up to 10 to 15,000. I think there are a lot of people who are interested in this material, but we really haven't put a lot of effort into promoting and getting the word out there. So we're taking a step back. We're looking at what needs to happen to make this a gold standard podcast. And this will also include really stepping up the people that we're interviewing. So someone who I'm interviewing very soon is an author who I really admire, Charles Eisenstein. I'd also like to get people like Gabor Mate, uh, Rick Doblin, talking with Jim Fadiman about a potential appearance. So really, really also stepping up into these kind of higher level people, quote unquote, because we've already interviewed a lot of high level people, but just consistently across the board, names that you would recognize from mainstream media publications. And again, I see this as being part of the larger narrative and changing the the cultural conversation around psychedelics. That's announcement number one. We're taking a break and we'll be back at the beginning of October. I promise. Announcement number two is we're releasing our flagship microdosing course. So basically, the focus of this course is to help people address the three main problems that come up whenever they think of starting a microdosing protocol. Problem number one is sourcing. So we won't actually provide the substance because that's highly illegal, obviously. But we are trying to create a community of people who are interested in microdosing and communities can communicate. Obviously, that's a big part of being part of a community, even online through apps like Signal and by uh, leveraging cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So that's the first issue that we want to help address, although that will be more indirect. Uh, The second issue that we want to help address is validity of information. So obviously, a lot of the work that I've been doing has been under the advice and guidance of Dr. James Fadiman, the father of microdosing. And I want to then take that advice that I've gotten from Jim and all the work that he's done, and I want to combine it with all the things that I've learned about the intersection of microdosing and flow states and microdosing and leadership development, microdosing really for the betterment of well-being. And I want to create a comprehensive online course that has information that everyone can trust when it comes to microdosing. That's the second problem we want to overcome is validity of information. And the third and the biggest problem that I want to overcome, and this will be a problem regardless of whether microdosing is legal or illegal, it will be a problem regardless of where, you know, the quality of information that one is receiving. And that's is how do you customize a microdosing protocol for your needs? 
So the reason that everyone gets into microdosing is probably slightly different because everyone's life is a little bit different. Although we have these overarching reasons like depression or addiction, social anxiety, procrastination, emotional bonding, I think there are nuances within everyone's life that if they can take this concept or technology of microdosing and customize it like a glove for their personal situation, then they can really get the most out of it. Because I think microdosing as a tool has a tremendous ability to unleash and unlock incredible potential in each and every one of us. So really that's going to be the core of the course is, okay, you've got the substance, you understand the basics of microdosing, how do you utilize it? for your specific purpose fully. We're releasing that course on Tuesday, August 29th. Okay, so we're releasing the course Tuesday, August 29th. That's in a couple days from when you're listening to this. We are only letting in 100 people initially. So if you want in on that course, make sure you're on our social media, make sure you're on the email list, but we'll be releasing it for only 100 people for that soft launch. It will be $127 as a one-time payment, which will get you lifetime access to all the course updates. You're at the infancy of what we know about microdosing so far. And what I plan to create is a course that will be consistently and constantly updated with all the cutting edge information that we know about microdosing. So for example, when the research comes out from Beckley about their LSD microdosing study, we'll be integrating that into the course and talking about how you can apply it to your life to improve and better your life. When we learn more about what microdosing is doing in the brain, we'll include that in the course. We're going to include exclusive interviews with various people as well that won't be released anywhere else. And obviously a number of other things, including like customized protocols, including best practices, including how to utilize microdosing for leadership or creativity or you know low mood, whatever it might be. $127. We're only letting in 100 people at that price and we'll release it on Tuesday, August 29th. If you can't get in at that point, if you're, for example, at Burning Man or if you're just generally busy, we'll be re-releasing kind of the major course, the full fleshed out course, which we'll be promoting every which way. That will be in probably early to mid-October. And that price point will likely be at $197. So if you get in now, you get it at $127 plus we'll send you a free microdosing kit as saying thank you for getting in early. So that's just the two announcements from the third wave. We're taking a break and we've got a microdosing course. What else? Let's kind of get into the typical before I uh, discuss our guest for this week. So this week in psychedelics, just two announcements. One, a woman was banned from the US after a border agent found proof of illicit drug use on her phone. So the woman from Canada had her email searched while she was trying to cross into the US border. And basically, the border agents found an email that she had sent to her doctor about a fentanyl overdose that she had survived a year ago. She's been issued a lifetime ban from the United States as a result. So basically, the story is this woman was at a strip club. She snorted what she thought was cocaine. It was actually fentanyl. She was sent to the hospital, almost died, survived, had an email that she had sent to her doctor about it. The U.S. border agents found it, and they've now banned her for life. So this is relevant, obviously, to this crowd because psychedelics are still illegal. Psychedelics are still Schedule One substances. And although we have the freedom of speech to openly talk about them, we unfortunately do not have the legal right to use them. So if you have been using them, like I have, and if you've talked about it in some sort of app or email, delete those emails or hide them so that border agents do not see them if you plan to cross into the United States. That's that. Next thing, Norway takes a major step towards LSD decriminalization in the Supreme Court. They will decide whether current penalties are in line with the scientific evidence regarding LSD's safety. Decision is expected around the 25th of August, which is just before this podcast will be published. So check out Emma Sophia, Emma Sophia, for more details on that. I'll kind of give you the brief overview on August 17th. For the first time since 1999, the Norwegian Supreme Court reviewed the penalty level for import and dealings with LSD. The court will decide whether or not today's penalty level for dealings with LSD is in accordance with an updated scientific assessment of the risk and health profile. Boom! LSD is not dangerous. It is the second safest recreational drug that you can consume after psilocybin mushrooms. So I'm excited to see what happens in Norway. That's that. If you like this podcast and you want to continue to help support it, improve the quality, we have a Patreon, patreon.com backslash the third wave, and we would really appreciate your support in that. As well, as always, if you like the podcast, could you leave a review on iTunes? 
please. And maybe just share it with a few friends. If you think they'd find information that's valuable in this podcast, we ask that you share it with them. So now, without further ado, our guest for this week, and this is one of my favorite podcasts that we've done so far, is Bia Labate, who joins us for a discussion on ayahuasca, shamanism, and cultural evolution. Bia's expertise is in anthropology, and through this discussion, she gives us a unique perspective on what the commercialization of ayahuasca means for the future of psychedelics and how psychedelic traditions and cultures will be affected by the growing mainstream popularity of plant medicines. We spoke in total for about an hour and a half. I think the podcast might be cut down to like an hour and 10 or an hour and 15 minutes. So it's a little bit longer than usual, but this is definitely, I've been wanting to do this interview for a long time. Bia is basically the foremost authority on ayahuasca and we had a fantastic conversation. So without further ado, I bring you Bia Lavate. We can pretty much just start, you know, by talking about the conference that you're organizing in Mexico. So I would love to hear more about that. Basically, what's the topic of the conference? Why did you want to organize this conference? Let's just talk a little bit about that to start off. Okay, so we're going to do this conference called uh, Sacred Plants in the Americas. It's going to be February 23 and 24 in Ajijic, in Chapala Lake. It's the biggest lake in Mexico, in the state of Jalisco. I live in Guadalajara, and uh, it's an awesome conference, and I'm really, really excited about it, and we just launched the website today. It's the first public announcement, so it's the result of several months of work and networking and connections, and years, in fact, because we wrote a, a project to OSF, Open Society Foundation, and um it took a long time to get approved, and we had to go through this whole bureaucracy. It took almost a year and a half, and then I got a very generous grant. So the conference is very lucky, and uh, it's a kind of, uh, I think, peak of my career and of my interests and of the different universes that I navigate in and the different connections and networks. And I kind of move between Brazil, I'm Brazilian. Mexico, where I live, and California, uh, where I'm currently staying for one semester. The conference is uniting people from this three countries plus other people from Europe. And it's a big combination and bridge between the topic of psychedelics and drug policy. Go a little bit more. So like, what was the inspiration for that? Because I was just talking about this with someone the other day, basically saying, I think psychedelics are sitting at this really interesting point in time where like, Cannabis has become pretty normalized. I mean, in certain parts still, the, you know, there are taboos, but like it's kind of accepted that cannabis will become legalized. But psychedelics, when you talk to the average person, they're still like, oh, that's a schedule one. You know, those are highly addictive. There's a lot of misinformation. So like I would be interested to hear more about the inspiration for like organizing this conference. Why did it come about? Sure. So uh, I think that this link between psychedelics and drug policy is something that really needs more attention and in many regards has been underestimated. So it's like you have a lot of resistance of making this dialogue, this bridge between these two universes. On the one side, the people that are related to like religious use of psychedelics, the traditional religions or ethnic and, and tribal uses, frequently reject the label of drugs to their substances and they don't like to be equated on the same... Um, level of, let's say, people that use peyote or ayahuasca to be put in the same level of discussion of people that use methamphetamine or cocaine or heroin. Even, uh, you know, the logo of, of our uh, collective, Drugs, Culture, and, and Politics, has a little logo of a peyote and then of a needle and different substances, and some people were pretty mad to see all them lined up. So this, this is one, one of the actors. The other actors are frequently the medical doctors, psychologists, and health uh, workers that want to advocate for legalization for medical uses of psychedelics and think that equating 
these medical uses of psychedelics for specific diseases under certain controlled settings with a lot of preparation, screening, and integration is a, a battle in itself and should be not mixed up with other political agendas such as the recreational use of cannabis or legalization or discriminization of all drugs and frequently also deny being put on side by side with other substances. Then there's the people from the universe of drug policy that frequently are prejudiced against uh, psychedelics and think that this is not a real problem and this is not a real issue and psychedelics are not related to major violence problems or public health problems or just immigration and geopolitics and that it's a kind of vanity project or a minority project or irrelevant in terms of social impact. This is a kind of paradox where because their damage is not that enough, it doesn't call the attention for policymakers to want to discuss rescheduling and discuss a focus on psychedelics. Now, of course, uh, I created a little bit, you know, stereotyped picture just for the sake of making a point, because in between there are others like myself, and I'm not the only one, there's a bunch of us that do think that there's a lot of dialogue between the two universes and that it's important to make these connections and to create these bridges. So I think that one of the great merits of our conference is convincing funders and donors that this is relevant and that, in fact, uh, we we should uh, be getting grants and, and financial support to be working on such topics. So I am particularly happy that it cost me a long time and a long career to be able to convince people of the relevance of this. Uh, for example, I, I previously worked on a drug policy program in a university where they did not consider any of the publications that I do relative to ayahuasca, peyote, or other sacred plants as drug policy work, because it's not, you know, related to the mainstream drugs, so to speak. So this conference reaches a big goal. On the other side, there's another dialogue that needs to, to be done. It's between the universe of people that study traditional drug use or contemporary drug use in the context of more spiritual, therapeutic, shamanic, religious circles. So all the movement of the globalization of ayahuasca or the even the expansion of different peyote circles in kind of TP formats or more new age contemporary circles, either by indigenous people or by movements such as the Camino Rojo, the Red Path. All this universe of the, so to speak, sacred shamanic religious use and the universe of the scientific research on plant medicines. So that is also a kind of cross-dialogue that has not been done very much. Frequently, there's a kind of division of labor where people that are more from the bio and the sea field are studying the potentials of substances like ayahuasca or salvia or boga from a scientific point of view and frequently they are not in dialogue with the people from social sciences and the ethnography and the users and the practitioners so a good example of this was psychedelic science 2017 i worked in that conference for one year i was part of the organization it was a great gig that i got with maps I have been collaborating with MAPS for 10 years now, and I have lobbied a lot, and I was uh, well succeeded in my lobbying, and we had a whole plant medicine track. So in previous conferences, we had ayahuasca track, more or less, you know, shy, and it got more and more attention, and this time it was a plant medicine track. So the conference was still mainly focused on, on scientific research and on MDMA and psilocybin, a little bit LSD and ketamine and all that. But inside the conference, we had a one whole track called plant medicines that, okay, I'm not going to get now in here to the definition of plant medicines. But anyway, the idea is that you incorporated more other ways of knowledge. So more social sciences, more anthropology, more of the perspective of the users so the practitioners and more this um, more women, more indigenous people, more voices from the global south. So it was, uh, you know, now the conference in Mexico is going to be a confluence of several projects that I have 
done throughout my career that unite these different streams. So as I said, different disciplines, different countries, and it's a, a kind of mix between the World Ayahuasca Conference, which I also worked, which was led by ICERS in uh, 2016 in Rio Branco in the Brazilian Amazon, which the big emphasis was ayahuasca, and it had a lot of anthropologists and 150 indigenous people, and a mix of this with a mix of psychedelic science that had more biomedical research and had a plant medicine track with it. And also another conference that we did in Brazil last year called Jornadas Plantas Sagradas in Perspectiva, the journeys or the, the encounters of sacred plants in perspective. And this one, we went deep on ethnology. Ethnology is a branch of anthropology, at least in Portuguese, that's how we define it, because there's variation in different languages that is dedicated to indigenous people. So in this conference, we brought together more than 40 substances, and some of them pretty unknown and pretty unique and pretty out of the radar or out of the trendiness, such as, for example, poison to kill fish or substances given to dogs for them to hunt and all kinds of snuffs and all kinds of poisons and, you know, from hallucinogens to others. So we had a lot of anthropology and a lot of different substances and plurality. And now in Mexico, we're going to have a little bit of all of that. And I want to invite everybody that is hearing this podcast uh, to keep on tuned on our social media and our upcoming announcements. What we're trying to do in this conference is to have a lot of anthropologists. And the original vision of the conference was as simple as that. One indigenous person and one plant from each different part of Mexico and the Americas. Of course, that's not very easy to do, but we do have uh, one uh, Wichol or Wirarica, as they call themselves, in the scientific commission of the conference. And we also have one Mazatec in the scientific commission of the conference. And I'm trying to get Nahuatl and Tarahumara, Raramuri and uh, other ethnicities to come and join. And, of course, the idea here is to go deeper and make it really more inclusive and give these people the stand. But it's very hard to make conferences that, that you give space to plural voices because it's not easy. On pragmatic terms, to connect these people, to reach them, to bring them, to get visas, to access them. And it's not easy to incorporate them in an academic format either. Like it's very potentially suffocating to get an elder, indigenous elder, and tell him, here's your 20 minutes. And after that, I'm going to take your mic away. Yeah. I want to kind of like summarize a little bit for like the listeners okay. in terms of some trends that you're talking about, which, you know, we've been picking up on as well. And I know that you have started Chakuna and Copy, which we'll get into a little bit. And I bet many of our listeners are familiar with. Chakuna, because you guys have been publishing long form pieces. And these are topics that you often write about on there, particularly this kind of necessity of evolving from this science first kind of materialist, reductionist, molecule only, you know, laboratory framework to understanding that there are more holistic kind of ways of knowing and ways of understanding that our current system doesn't accept. So for example, it would be very difficult, almost impossible with the way our current system is set up to like get prescribed a plant medicine like ayahuasca or peyote because there's so many different variables. So to facilitate that in a laboratory is difficult. I was you know, recently at breaking convention in London about six weeks ago and I was speaking to someone there who is living in Zurich and who's working with the Mind Foundation out of uh, Berlin, and he's trying to get ayahuasca prescribed in Switzerland. And he's like, the biggest thing is it's not a molecule. So it's really, really difficult to go through that process. So what I'd be curious, you know, based on your expertise, because one thing we haven't got into yet, which maybe we should dig a little bit into is like, how did this all start for you? So you're from Brazil. When did your journey start with plant medicines specifically. And then I want to tie that into what you're talking about with, with the conference in Mexico. Something like I had a vision. <laughs> well, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody does, don't they? Did you read Carlos Castaneda and, <laughs> and get inspired to, uh, probably not because you're, you're from Sao Paulo. So I would imagine, you know, just being there and living there, you had plenty of exposure to, to ayahuasca. Well, I, I got to know, um, when I was 20 years old, I was a backpacker around the world for one and a half year. And then I tried a bunch of things like LSD and um, peyote and mushrooms. 
And they were absolutely revolutionary and mind-changing and substantial points of revelation for me. That was when I was pure and young and naive at the age of 20, 21, backpacking for one and a half year, doing a lot of adventures and just being really curious out there in the world. After that, I had a big break of like, I think around five years that I haven't tried anything or done anything. And I just enjoyed my memories and my my great experiences. And then in, when I was 26, your age, I tried ayahuasca. And I had a super incredible experience. I, it was in the south of the state of Minas Gerais. So I used to live in Campinas, uh, Sao Paulo state. And I went to a UDV church. We had a little house in this town, a bunch of you know, young students from the university rented a house together. 13 women for one room <laughs> with one bed bunk and one double bed. Oh my and gosh. we turned itself. And one of these weekends that I went over there, I, I, I joined this UDV ceremony. And it was just the most beautiful, revealing thing. And I really was completely felt completely blessed and feeling on this like eternal light of wisdom and power and magic and enchantment. And I just told myself, I put two and two together and I'm an anthropologist and I've been a backpacker all my life. And I said, hey, I'm just going to go to the Amazon where everything started. I'm just going to jump this shortcut here and I'm going to go. And then I took off. I went in November to the ceremony. And then in December, I hit the road for this big trip. And I, I bought this camera because I decided I was going to do a documentary. Highly naive, highly naive, highly pure, highly well-intentioned. I look retrospectively, I feel a little bit like that cartoon of Mr. Magoo, you know, that <laughs> he was kind of blind, but he was so optimistic and he was doing all these very dangerous things, but convinced that he's doing something else. And he just had so much, you know, good vibes in his heart that he was always protected and nothing bad happened. So that's 20 years later. I'm 46 now. That's a little bit how I see that first trip because I just went everywhere and drank with everybody completely like open, like open to all kinds of spiritual venereal diseases. And it's just very open and just talk to everybody. And then that was when I had this vision, right? Like the founding vision of, of me in this path was when I had this insight that I had to organize a conference for the whole world to know about this power, this magic, this light from the Amazon forest, from the queen of the forest. And then I came back. Of course, at that time, I thought that typical ayahuasca, I thought I had this great idea and I was kind of told by the plant to do that. Then I, I realized that other people also had this idea and that I was not the first person who had this idea and there was a whole field of things going on. But back then it was much less than now. It was not like the real pioneers, which were on the 60s. Like if you think of a guy like Michael Horner that went to Peru on the, you know, 1961 or Jing Langdon that went to the Putumayo on like the beginning of the 70s or the McKinnis. But still in 1997, 96, 20 years before now, it was not as trendy as popular. It was not all conferences all over. And then I, I just went to my university. I was a master's student and I spoke to my professors and I said, there's this great thing going on in the Amazon and the indigenous people and this and that. And then I had a friend that studied medicine and I spoke to him and I said, let's go talk to them. They should give us money. We should hire some people, you know, some medical doctors. And we went there and we got funding and, you know, we just went on and on. And it was just smooth. And then organized like this two to three day conference with one international guest or two and called the first cura, the Congresso do Uso Ritual da Ayahuasca, the conference on the ritual use of ayahuasca. And it was fabulous because it was a, like a mainstream university. So that was not the first conference in Brazil. They had already had it in Rio Branco in the state of Acre. They had it in Salvador in the, like 93 or something. But this was a big, big university in Sao Paulo. So that was kind of, you know, it has more impact in a way and it really created this collective community and spirit and out of that conference I created my first book collection and started to develop my 
you know, my greatest talent or virtue, which is an editorial one. So I created a book collection. It took like two or three years to make called the, the Ritual Use of Ayahuasca. It was three parts. It was one part was ayahuasca among forest people and religions. So both indigenous, mestizo and the Brazilian ayahuasca religions and more anthropology. And then there was one session on, well, the first was on forest people, the second on the religions, and the third was on like biomedical research on ayahuasca. So it was a kind of little new ayahuasca Bible. And the launching was highly celebrated. And a lot of people, like the feeling we had is that all the, you know, the rats come out of their hiding spots and they just gathered for this launch. It was so happy, so beautiful, so intense. They were singing and people felt so emotional, like, you know, kind of this pride about ayahuasca that it's being recognized at least I felt like that. I don't know. Maybe it was my early golden days that I was feeling so enamored by the whole thing. And the fact is that the book had a history in itself. And I started to get invited to give a lot of lectures. And there's an institutional gap on this area. Like, if people want to learn about it, want to talk about it, want to share, want to just delve into it, where do they go? What do they do? There's not institutional places where you can go and talk about these things. If you have, you know, if you like gardening, you can just go to this gardening club and, and join kindred people. But when it comes to ayahuasca, the knowledge is, is fragmented and it's frequently stigmatized and it's frequently out of access. Again, nowadays it's much better. But still, I think that a lot of people are longing for information and for places to exchange knowledge and dialogue and so I became a little bit a kind of public figure in this field, first in Brazil and then abroad, always conveying knowledge, um, publishing scientific books and organizing conferences, giving lectures, giving consultancies to the media, and just doing a lot of random lost and found stuff regarding ayahuasca. There's a lot going on. There is a lot going on. I think, you know, one question I wanted to kind of go into a little bit more was, you know, you talked about this conference that you organized. Was this in like the late 90s, like 97? 97, yeah. Okay, 97. And then obviously you talked about how you, you know, I was at the World Ayahuasca Conference in, in Rio Branco. I saw how extensive it was. It was five days, the 17th through the 22nd. There were dozens you know, of panels, like you said, 150 indigenous people. It was massive. And it was in the middle of nowhere. Like I remember to get there, I had to fly from Lisbon because I was living in Lisbon at the time. So I had to fly from Lisbon to Rio, to Brasilia, to Rio Branco, and then back the same way again. So, and there was still like a huge turnout. So my question would be, what was that conference like in 1997? Like what type of talks did you have? And how has it evolved in 20 years and in that like evolution process right of ayahuasca like why do you think it's evolved so much so why is ayahuasca growing so much in popularity so i guess first let's start with the comparison like the small conference in 97 to like the world ayahuasca conference what's changed in 20 years in terms of what people are talking about at conferences well if i was actually older i think the more cool comparison would be to compare the conference that was organized in 1986 by luis eduardo luna in bogota in the context of the americanist conference that was probably what is the first international conference on ayahuasca that also united anthropologists and people from the biomedical or health field and had an indigenous representative. So I think there is, you know, a common thread between that conference, our conference in 97 and the World Ayahuasca Conference in 2014 in, in Ibiza and the 2017 in Rio Branco. And I think that one of the cool things about the ayahuasca field, it is that it is very multidisciplinary. I think it's since the beginning it has shown this ability, you know, it's such a complex and dense and fascinating phenomenon that really no single discipline can tackle it down. You really need cooperative research and different perspectives. And the other thing is that I think, you know, different than other other fields, it's it's much harder to exclude indigenous people like you would normally, you know, because their knowledge is so prevalent and so important and foundational. And I think all these conferences have had a little bit of this attempt to include other voices 
and to include the voice of practitioners, because this dialogue between policymakers, social scientists, health and biopsy experts, and practitioners is really a good model on how we can advance knowledge. And I think that in this regard, ayahuasca is a great laboratory that has a lot to teach to us on how to talk about drugs and how to have good dialogues about drug policy. I think particularly the case of Brazil, and this was very clear in 97, but more in 2017, it's this idea that you really need to have cooperation between different voices to create working agendas. No, I think the most prominent thing about the conference in, in Rio Branco in 2017 was the indigenous participation. They were really massive. And they, they made a very strong statement on the end, saying something like, this dialogues can't happen without us, and we are people that are the, the traditional guardians or the founders, the, the people who, who have this knowledge, and we need to be included in the conversation. We need to be heard. And it was pretty beautiful to see their participation. And what was also interesting to me was that despite there were so many, we I wrote a paper with a colleague from Brazil, Sandra Gulan, about the conference, and we talked about the multiple ayahuascas of the World Ayahuasca Conference. Like, can we even talk just about one ayahuasca? There's so many perspectives on what ayahuasca is. To start off with, how do you name it? How do you call it? So, you know, there's several Waska different... Waska or Daime or ya Yaye, I think, is another one, right? And several different native names. And then ayahuasca can be an object of scientific inquiry. It can be a sacrament. It can be a tool. It can be a medicine. It can be something for spiritual development. It can be related to identity, to ethnicity, to territory. And these multiple um, views kind of clashed and were in conflict. But at the same time that they were in conflict and they clashed, I think that there is this emergence of this kind of idea that there is a global movement and a global interest in the topic. So it all depends on how you want to see. I think a lot of people will have gone to that conference and say, well, you really show this too many conflicts and there is no common agreements and there is no points of commonality. And other people will say there's multiple views and there's multiple perspectives and depending on where you stand, you see different things. But there's also a kind of creation of a common agenda where people seem to be each time more worried with things like the sustainability of ayahuasca, the commodification of ayahuasca, the emergence of charlatans or opportunist people, the needs of regulation, the problems of criminalization, and just the need to document and register the beauty and the diversity. Then again, there's so many things to say about that conference. That conference was so intense because not only we had six full days of a full main track happening we had also three parallel tracks happening and we had rituals every night i went so to one had, of them which one did you go to i i think it was on the very last night and they did it in the amphitheater just inside and it was full disclosure i still haven't had like a proper ayahuasca experience in the jungle so most of my psychedelics use is lsd mushrooms dmt and then mdma which is not really a major psychedelic so like i was kind of like you know, in your you in your early 20s, when you were talking about how you were having fun, you were exploring a lot of that for me was in my early 20s. And lately, I've been more into microdosing, but I'm starting to get more into plant medicines. You know, I, I'd like to start to experience ayahuasca as well as peyote and San Pedro. So like, I was very nervous going into that because I was expecting this ayahuasca experience, but the medicine that they served, it was diluted, I think, because there were like 70 people were drinking. And so I only had one cup. And I know a few other people had more than that. And so there were some people who were definitely having the experience, whereas with me, it wasn't as significant. So I was a little, I don't know if disappointed is the right word. It seemed like there were too many people who were trying to drink at the same time. And that led to certain precautions being taken, which, which were obviously necessary for the content. Well, but that's also a typical ayahuasca experience, because as I'm sure you heard, sometimes you can drink ayahuasca and not get a full, you know, what you think is a full experience. Like that's the mystery of ayahuasca. It's not really completely dose dependent and it's not predictable. And 
what people that drink ayahuasca believe, and I'm modestly going to place myself in that category, is that you really get from ayahuasca what you need to get. And there's nothing like, you know, a bad experience. It's always a kind of teaching and a kind of learning. And sometimes the learning is subtle and sometimes the learning is not very clear. And sometimes it's not, a you know, a full orgasm. But that's nevertheless as legitimate as not. It's like a path. It's like a road that you travel in and, and you're traveling and you're learning. It's not like one thing. And it's multiple things. And it can be different things depending on your age, depending on the time of your life, if you're man or woman, depending on the day, depending on the moon, depending on so many things. So I, I wouldn't disregard your experience. I, and, I, and I don't. Yeah, I, I, I use even I was talking with Tanya Mate uh, right after because she was also at the, the ceremony and she said something very similar to what you're saying now. And so like after that, I took it as it was. At the same time, I do have plans to return and I would like to return sooner rather than later to the Amazon to have another experience. Well, I believe having, you know, personal experiences is is really important and speaking without e empirical experiences is really not very, very, I think in this field doesn't work a lot. It doesn't mean that if you drink a lot, you're really wise and then much less that you're going to write good papers about it. So I don't think that the relationship between drinking and writing about it, it's a big topic. In one line, I don't think it's fundamental to drink to write about it. And I don't think that if you drink, you're going to get guaranteed, you know, good papers about it. But definitely as a personal experience, I think it's very hard for you to talk about ayahuasca and have an idea of what ayahuasca is if you haven't taken it. So that's what, you know, frequently irritates us when we see uh, just ran random people giving opinion like certain policymakers or experts or, you know, medical doctors, people that never have seen a vine in their entire life. And if you show them whatever and any kind of substance or tree and told them that was ayahuasca, they couldn't tell because they have never seen one. They have never drank it. They don't know anybody who drank it or have seen it, but they feel so comfortable in giving opinions about that and frequently go on TV shows and media reports. This happens, really? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> yeah. I can I can tell you're a little irritated by that. Well, you know, it's very irritating because the media sometimes has this idea, like they send out, you know, the journalists with the idea you got to have the two sides of the story. Like you have that's good media, that's good journalism. You need to put both perspectives. So the one side they get people like me that have studied this for twenty years and published seventeen books and has gone 30 times to the Amazon and drank a lot of ayahuasca. And I know what I'm talking about. And on the other side, they get, you know, a professor that is a medical doctor in whatever mainstream American university. And that has maybe had a course on psychedelics when he was 25 in university. And they're giving both sides of the question. But this person is simply not informed. He's ignorant. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So I do get irritated about that. And I also get irritated that as an anthropologist, my opinion seemed not to count so much sometimes. So there's a very unfair division of labor where everybody says that drugs should be understood from like a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary perspective that is set setting the substance, set and setting. So both the pharmacology, the individual and his personal intentions and expectations, characteristics, and then the social context, the setting. But in fact, what we see in public drug policy is that the setting is super disregarded. It's really just the cherry on top of the cake. Like nobody really cares to talk about the setting and understand the setting well. And that's where, you know, us, we anthropologists know, have a lot to say because the setting is totally fundamental on, on the experience. I mean, it is completely different if you take a substance recreationally with a bunch of friends in a nightclub than if you go to a shamanic ritual with an indigenous person. I'm not saying that one is bad and the other is good. I'm not saying that one is wrong and the other is right. I'm just saying that there are different contexts and the same substance taken in different contexts will have different effects. People will experience those things in different ways. So the context is not minor. The context is not less relevant. The context is as central as the substance. And the whole idea of, you know, the system of drug policy is very much 
the international conventions is this kind of random list that divides substances according to their pharmacology and places some in certain categories, giving very, very, very little importance to the context, to traditions, to cultural roots, to all the multiple links that the substances have in people's lives, in their relationship to socialization, to identity, to territory, to celebration, uh, to communication, to transmission of knowledge and all those things. And do you think that's changing now? Because this kind of gets back to our conversation before, you know, how four years ago when MAPS, even in the psychedelic space, when MAPS organized the Conference for Psychedelic Science, the plant medicine track was much, much smaller, more the emphasis was on the clinical science, the molecules, you know, MDMA, psilocybin, ketamine, uh, LSD. Whereas this year, 2017, because of the growth of popularity in ayahuasca and peyote, and I think also because of larger cultural things going on, where more and more people are recognizing kind of the limits of really materialist kind of just things that exist in a vacuum that's not really representative of reality as we experience in it. And by incorporating substances like ayahuasca and peyote in a pharmacological sense, uh, where it's not just the molecule, but it's everything around it. It's the entire experience, what I like to call the container that we create, the context. Jim Fadiman talks about the set and setting, you know, the six S's, set, setting, substance, three more, which I really don't remember offhand. Are you hopeful? Are you optimistic that culturally some of these conversations are starting to change? Or do you think we're going to remain stuck in this kind of narrow point of perceiving drugs and molecules and substances? No, I'm definitely very, very enthusiastic. And, you know, it was my great honor to be part of the opening of Psychedelic Science. So it was just three people, Rick Dobling, Amanda Fielding, and I. And that was my whole shtick. That's what I advocate in, in my opening, that I was there. I was a foreigner, Brazilian, a woman, an anthropologist, not a medical doctor, not somebody, you know, powerful American or from Europe. And I was there in the opening and I, I feel that I earned that space by, you know, doing this work of advocacy and of scientific research and insisting on this kind of message, which I think echoes a lot of the spirit of times and people are interested in this kind of things. And I also think that's why MAPS gave this space of plant medicine to make a, a track which was not only one track it was called almost a double track we had three tracks but the plant medicine track was almost double the other tracks it was almost 50 percent more not exactly 50 percent but you know almost so we had a, a huge space why because also there's so much research blossoming with ayahuasca and so much other research blossoming with other substances and there's the great interest in these substances in culture and people are interested in talking about them and having those conversations. So the folks that like plant medicines, they are a great number of the people that attend psychedelic science conferences. So the organizers want to be able to accommodate this kind of public. And I think that's also why, you know, I got that space and we, we were able to influence the course of the conference. And why do you think it's growing so much in popularity? Why is it that... There are so many Americans, because this is obviously a huge issue as well with ayahuasca, is the growth and the potential commercialization. And I think there were some discussions even at the World Ayahuasca Conference between indigenous people and the rest of the community about the commercialization of ayahuasca. Why is it, do you think, that ayahuasca is growing so much in popularity? And like, what are your concerns going forward about kind of the potential growth and commercialization of the plant medicine? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have any too brilliant, you know, answer. I think we launched last year a book that was a result of the first World Ayahuasca Conference. So the book is called The World Ayahuasca Diaspora, Reinventions and Controversies. And I am co-editor of this book with Alex Gearing and Clancy Kavner. And the preface of the book is written by Glenn Shepard, and he titles it The Genie is Out of the Bottle. So ayahuasca remained a kind of obscure thing in travel writers and botanists and people interested in South American shamanism and anthropologists or just, you know, very fringy underground stuff like Burroughs and Ginsberg's, the Yaha letters and that start, sort of thing. But since the 80s and 90s and more and more in the, the 2000s, it really did hit big cities and then 
it combined with multiple aspects of contemporary cosmopolitan cultures and combined to different forms of spirituality to both in Brazil, for example, to offer religious movements or to alternative therapies, all kinds of phenomena like yoga or meditation or Hinduist orientalist new age tendencies. And this has happened in Brazil and has happened in, in other um, countries as well. And, and it's a process both of in South America, leaving the Amazon and arriving in the big cities and uh, the foreigners going to South America and the shamans going abroad and doing their own researches, their own connections and, and activities as well. And then as a side thing related to that is the interest in the expansion of scientific research about it. And then you have all the hybridity that, you know, appears from all these universes because you have more and more researchers that sort of become initiated or traditional people that get interested in research. And then you create all these new hubs that are hard even to classificate because they are just a mix of several tendencies. And I think this interest has to do, uh, you know, there's many ways to understand it, but it has to do with the expansion of, of the new age movement and of alternative therapies and alternative like religious uh, movements. And they are appealed towards, you know, institutionalized religions or more traditional Western medical systems that people are not satisfied and do not find answers in those traditional systems, either religious or therapeutic medical. Bob Jesse was kind of speaking about this at Horizons, I remember this past year, 10 months ago, when, well, his talk was about like a potential backlash, but he was specifically talking about like religion and, you know, kind of, you know, because Bob heads up the Council of Spiritual Practice. And someone asked him this and he kind of, I think it was him or someone else who said new age, which is what you're talking about, is like, it's kind of like a soup of all these things. Whereas I think with something, particularly with like ayahuasca, when we're talking about answers, I think that was what kind of I was drawn to and what you said is the experience, the psychedelic experience, you know, whether that's with plant medicines like ayahuasca and peyote that exist within oftentimes an indigenous context or the experiences that people have, for example, in the clinical studies with psilocybin, it's providing answers to this sense of like an existential crisis that a lot of Westerners are going through as like these models that we've lived on for so long have kind of failed us. And I, I think that for me is like, it tends to encapsulate at least a big part of why ayahuasca has grown in popularity, but all, it also that also then speaks to all these things that you're saying is like the dangers of that continuing to grow because if Westerners continue to take the mindset that they've been raised in and almost like apply it to the pursuit, so to say, of these experiences, that's when commercialization happens. And that's when almost becomes stripped away from like its indigenous nature and context. I think uh, people like, you know, a lot, there's all this trend to, you know, every week, every day, there's a new article, psychedelics can heal this, psychedelics can heal that. And psychedelics are new hope for medicine. And people like a lot to say that, you know, psychedelics are providing answers that we can't find elsewhere. Like this big criticism of, you know, modernity or postmodernity. But I think it's more complicated than that because it's that, but it, this expansion and, and the way people relate to these things is frequently also, you know, it's a product of this very modernity. It's a product of this expert systems where people each time consume more alternatives on how to be happy and how to have wellness and how to be an expert in different areas of their life. So the way this grows and evolves, it's very much related to many regards to our ideas of individual and of self that are very contemporary phenomena that have to do little with the teachings or, you know, general doctrines of where these plants come from. So I don't know if you if you understand what I'm saying, but I understand. Maybe, oh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. We're appropriating that, but not necessarily transforming our paradigms and not necessarily yes. understanding what indigenous people do and have to say. So for me, that kind of speaks to that paradigm is they don't really the tech execs don't really get it. It's not about them. It's, it is like this sense of going through ay ayahuasca is this sense of transcending the ego, the sense of going beyond the individual and coming to this like understanding of community and connection and 
I don't know. I mean, we could go into like non-duality and, you know, this collective mindset, but then it's like, okay, if we experience that, how do we live that out in our everyday life? And we still, when people come back to like a Western world, like you're, you're in San Francisco right now, right? Like, and I remember in our conversations that we've had a little bit, you know, you've, you've had some previous issues with like the way that things happen in America, which is because it's, I think partly it's so individual. And so like people come back to this mindset and they've stepped out of that paradigm, but then they step right back into it when they're living here for, you know, most of their time. I just uh, had this great revelation that, you know, there's all this really, really awesome, incredible, alternative, underground, radical, postmodern, revolutionary things going on in California all the time, which Uh is the reason why I fell in love with California and wanted to live here. Uh But then when you looked at it, you know, there's this amazing events, it's like super like questioning mainstream and status quo and all. And then I put like interested in Facebook, but I don't, I don't look at it very well. And then when I look next, like the upcoming event and you click there and it's like $50, one lecture, $30, <laughs> everything costs. And I'm like walking around telling my friends, hey, you're making this revolutionary lecture, but you have to pay Thirty dollars to you know to go to this community event. So they are making a little bit fun of my process of Americanization and trying to figure out America. And the other day, I I, I said I didn't want any hashtags with my breakfast. <laughs> and my friend said, "What? Oh, you mean hash browns? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and also as a Brazilian, I'm so shocked about the underground circles of ayahuasca in the U.S. And I'm just I feel bad for my fellow Americans that it's so expensive." It's a lot of money. I mean, and here it's that thing, money talks, you know, and it becomes very elitist. And there's not a very much a sense of, like, community. It's a lot of circulation. So the groups are organized on mailing lists that people attend, like a retreat model. And there's not, like, continuation or a definite permanent group of people always attending and, and reasonable prices, which, again, doesn't mean that people don't have really good experiences and doesn't mean that I'm against it but I think that these are topics that emerge and I'm you know I'm particularly interested in this and this whole discussion about you know the legalization of ayahuasca in the U.S. that's a major concern for me major major what's the concern for you then particular to the legalization I am wishful that this underground circles could become legal because there's a Currently, from my modest perspective, and I'm a big traveler since, you know, since I'm a teenager, I have been continuously a nonstop traveler. So I've been all over the place. And what I see with this, this eyes that, you know, God gave me, as we say in Brazil, with my own eyes, I, I see that there's ayahuasca circles happening in the U.S. all over, in all cities, every weekend. So it's just grown a lot, substantially. We don't have a clue on numbers nobody knows that's like the magic question everybody's once every two weeks you get an email how many people drink ayahuasca in the world or how many people drink ayahuasca in the u.s and i want to say oh let me let me just click here and i'm gonna give you an answer like no hey sorry we don't have that answer like nobody knows like this totally hard to estimate so in any case there's a lot of people and these people live in constant fear like some more some less I have met people that you met in a cafe and they refuse to say the word ayahuasca in a cafe. And I'm like, sorry, it's going to be hard for us to have a conversation. (laughs) (laughs) I can't say that. Going out at any more dates. Yeah. (laughs) You can't, you know, people send emails that they can't, they use other words, meditation circles, prayer, all kinds of other, you know, strategies. And some are more or less paranoid. And then again, it's kind of surprising because the DA has been kind of really, really quiet. And if you think of this great expansion on the use of ayahuasca internationally, and I just want to make a short disclaimer that everything that I'm saying here doesn't represent the views of any institution or uh, projects to which I'm related to. They are my own views, so I can be... You could say whatever the hell you want. (laughs) Blame draw complimented about on my own expense. But I think that it's surprising that there is not so much more legal problems. We have know of a few legal cases. The most classic, perhaps known case, is the case of Taita Juan, who is a famous Yahe Taita from Putumayo region, very traditional, was, is now the governor of his region. And he was arrested in Houston and 
stayed in the airport and in the U.S., I think, around one month, and then sent back to Colombia and got his Yahya apprehended and can't come back to the U.S. I'm not sure if forever or for a few years. That was one case. And then, there, you know, there's here and there we hear certain, like one person got ayahuasca apprehended, the other one had a SWAT team went in because somebody had a, like a break in the, in the session and called the police, or there was a little case of uh, Alan Shoemaker with importation and exportation, but it's kind of quiet. However, in the last years, like two years, from 2015 on, you have the emergence of the so-called new ayahuasca churches or new Native American ayahuasca churches. And what are those? Those are groups that claim to be Native American branches. A lot of them were, at a certain point in their timeline, related to James Mooney or James Eagle. He has also another name. This person was claiming that he had the Onak church that was kind of like selling membership cards where you would have your use of ayahuasca or peyote or marijuana or in certain cases other things like topless or even prostitution or other kinds of illegal otherwise behaviors. You would have these rights protected if you were related to his church. And these claims from him came from the fact that he had won a case in the state of Utah, which later down was overruled and was much more complicated than that. And it's also a long story and, you know, I can't go into all the details, but it in fact is that these claims are really not true. And a lot of people, either out of goodwill or out of naivete or some maybe not so goodwill, joined and embarked in this narrative and uh, started to claim to be, you know, legal churches. And the, the most notorious one was a guy named Trinity de Guzman. And he launched a big campaign saying that ayahuasca healings was legal. And I was among one of the first people. I published a series of posts in my blog, so I have a blog, showing that it was really not legal. Because what the general argument that they make is that they are protected under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So there's two religions that are protected in the U.S. One is the UDV, the Union do Vegetal, that is uh, federally protected in all different states, and the other is the Santo Daime, that has a protection in just three states, Oregon, in L.A., and in Washington State, not Washington, D.C. And they were claiming ayahuasca healings that they had similar kinds of protections and that they were a Native American church and therefore... They were protected by law. And then they got a lot of people signing up for their retreats. Ends up that they advertised extensively, claimed they wanted to open 200 churches all over the country. And that generated a whole noise. And the result of that was the DEA sent them a, a kind of, I don't know the formal term, but it's something like Caesar or stop or something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. like we stop or you'll get fucked, basically. Yeah. Well, also, people disputed if the letter was nice or not, because sure. I think it was nice, because they, you know, they kind of gave a warning. So they eventually withdrew their movement, and uh, what they did next was file a religious exemption. And another group, led by Chris Young, just did the same thing. So uh, the DEA has put in place a mechanism. They have even published in, like, 2009 or something a document called Guidelines for Churches that Use Psychoactive Substances. And it's a short little piece that gives some recommendations. This was published after they had run a big case from Church of Reality that was a church that smoked marijuana and claimed that everybody had their right to, to smoke marijuana and everybody was, if you believed in, in reality and you used marijuana and you were related to them, you were a realist and you could have right. And um, I read this process recently and it's fascinating because both sides of the discussion looks like a real parody, like the claims from the church and the answers from the DA. So pages and pages and pages of like legal argumentation of sure. millions of dollars and months and eight years of debates. But basically they didn't win their case. And both ayahuasca healing and so quest have now filed for exemptions. So what is the idea of this process in a very like short explanation from a non-native speaker and a non-lawyer? So 
just anthropologist of- portrait from a Brazilian anthropologist. Yeah, yeah okay. just put a lot of filters and maybe I'm saying everything kind of wrong. I try to get the idea. I trust you. You're, you're Bia Labate. I trust you. No, don't trust me too much. <laughs> but the idea of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is that you have to prove that your movement is religious in nature. And you have to prove that your beliefs are sincere. So not only you're religious, but your beliefs are sincere. And then you have to say, you know, that the sustainability of your movement is burnt by specific government regulations. So on the one side, there is religious freedom. And on the other side, there's like drug policy law. So you have to show that the drug policy laws are burdening sincere expression of your religion. So therefore, the first question to be asked is, what is a religion? How do you define a religion? Well, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act doesn't bring a definition of religion in itself. So what they do is they use certain criteria that have appeared in previous court cases, such as the Myers criteria. And in general and rough lines, again, in my modest understanding, what is the Myers criteria main points? Is that you have to express fundamental and ultimate ideas that address reality beyond this like physical world. So you need to have religious beliefs that talk about this supernatural, ephemeral. Yes, so, and then you have to have a comprehensive ethical and moral system, like rules about what to do and how to do. Basically, they're saying that you have to have a structure that is kind of characteristic to that can be made an analogy to accepted religions and they even have like this whole list of things that you could sort of check and say if you have a religious movement or not like do you have a founder a prophet a teacher do you have important writings do you have gathering places do you have keepers of knowledge do you have ceremonies and rituals what is the structure of your organization do you have holidays do you have diets do you have fasting Do you have certain appearance and closing? What are your methods of propagation? So the question is, can we translate shamanism into a religious system? And I read also the regulations. And it's interesting because they have a footnote. We are not attached only to known religions. We are also open to other forms of religion. But the fact is that the definitions of religion are inspired in what we recognize as religion. And the West, not, in terms of we as in the yeah, West, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, like the major monotheistic religions of the world, Judaism, Christianity, Islamism. The question is, would you be able to translate these religious practices that are happening in shamanic circles to these models or not? And, you know, things like, for example, even if you're able to create a kind of religious doctrine, do all the participants that participate with you share this religious doctrine? And what is the system of membership? Do they have connections and ties to a permanent community? What is the difference between a religion and a kind of wellness center or a retreat model or a ceremonial model? And so as an activist and lover of the field and an academic interested in that, I just wish that there could be a great connection between all groups in the U.S. to discuss these things and a means to advance this agenda collectively. Because the fact that only two little tiny Brazilian religions have the the right to use ayahuasca in the U.S. UDV and Santa Daima, yeah? Yeah. As much as I'm a Brazilian, as much as I'm a lover of these religions, it is revolting to me. It's absurd. I mean, this is too limited. This is way, 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 way too restrictive. So how could we expand and under rich criteria and... Which parameters? There's a recent colleague anthropologist was criticizing this DEA model. And of course, there's problems with this model. But if we're going to throw away this model, what is there to stay? And what other the other alternatives that we have? So the fact is that the DEA has been developing a relationship to the DIME and to the UDV of you know, exchange and collaboration on different aspects. So they have also put, there is already a model going on about what the DA considers proper handling of the substance and of of the practices. We have recently published a very cool article in our site, Chakruna, by Robert Hefferman, that he addresses a little bit of this problem. It's called Seven 
best practices for ayahuasca, legal harm reduction. What is the idea of legal harm reduction? Is that you prevent, avoid having legal problems because once you have them, it's an escalating, you know, nightmare. Imagine fighting with the government. These guys have endless resources. They can just put another one, another one, another one. And, you know, the drug war machine has a bureaucracy and has a means of work that is very powerful and very entrenched. And the drug war has deep moral stigma and taboo roots in our societies Then we can never, ever underestimate. So once you get caught in that machine, it's not a good thing for you. So the idea is that we could advance a certain kind of education where people would be already looking to the practices that the DEA has put in place with the groups like mainly the UDV, but also the Santo Daime and take care of things like, for example, preparation and screening. So, you know, be really attentive to the health of the participants. Keep track of your core beliefs, your your lineage, your tradition. Have the history of your practices, of your church, of your community, of your spiritual congregation documented. And then the whole idea, where do you keep ayahuasca? So the DA has in this case, I have all these documents available in my website. It's a service that I do out of love and out of activism. And they are all there. People can read because people talk a lot, but read little and do little research, in fact, beyond, you know, sometimes superficial research. But one of the things that the DEA is really worried about is the diversion of the sacrament. So where do you keep it? Is it in a locked place? Does it have, you know, refrigerator? Does, who has access? Who has access to the keys? Do you have a track of your inventory? Can you account for how much has been used by who? And where? And then the other big topic is this, you know, this issue of multiple sacraments. Ayahuasca Healing has claimed that they use ayahuasca in San Pedro, and they were, you know, in this exemption request, just petitioning for ayahuasca, but maybe in the future they would do it for San Pedro. That, I don't think, was a very intelligent move, because the whole idea is that ayahuasca has to be central for the expressing of your Beliefs, because if it's not central, why do you need to do it? It's that idea of the burden. The government's rules have to be burdening you. So if you say, well, I can use other things, well, then use others and don't use this. Like, is this central to your practice or not? And if you use several substances, perhaps it's less likely that people would get approved. And then the whole idea of, you know, people that are advertising it aggressively, they are playing with fire. Mm -hmm. They can anytime have problems. So the fact that nobody really got problems, both the DEA, uh, both the ayahuasca healings and so quests got warning letters from the DEA. So who knows if the DEA is going to move on and decide to face them. And a lot of people say things like, well, you know, this is the law of the land and what they're doing is legal. And because the UDV and the Daimi are legal or because the Native American church is legal, what they do is legal. And because peyote is legal, it's not really like that. So I think that promoting ceremonies aggressively online is very complicated. And also just this whole idea that you have to pay for ceremonies, it's not very intelligent. Like one of these groups has the newsletter that, you know, signs off saying, thank you for doing business with us. The idea is that you have to be, you know, a religious community that is sharing the costs so sorry, I got carried away again. No, this is good. This is this is really, really good because you're right. I mean, when you're talking about this differentiation between underground circles and, you know, there's dozens of them in New York, there's dozens of them in the Bay Area, there's a ton in LA and actually legitimizing it, you know, legalizing it. There's only been, like you said, a couple people who have done that. Jeffrey Bronfman, right, was the main guy who led it through for UDV. That's correct. In the United States. Yeah, well, it was the religion UDV, and he was the master in charge at the time, and he had the whole process and uh, definitely used part of his personal fortune in advancing from, this. From Seagram's, because that's, that's his family, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, that, you know, that's very interesting as well, because uh, you can't deny that the relationship between legitimacy and legality is not straightforward. Mm. It's not like if you're legitimate, you're legal. If you're illegitimate, you're illegal. It's much more complex than that. And what we have seen in the case of ayahuasca is that there is really a relationship between being more powerful and having more money and being more organized and having legality. 
And, you know, I'm not against that, of course, but I, I wish we could go for inclusive, more inclusive policies. The other way to try to advance this would be the medical avenue. So leave aside this whole idea of religious freedom and the complexities of trying to fit this narrow views of religion into shamanism and what goes on in, on the underground and go for the medical venue. And then uh, I have been in dialogue also with MAPS with the idea of doing a clinical trial with ayahuasca and then ayahuasca would have to follow the same path that MDMA is following, going through all the studies like phase one, phase two, phase three, and eventually getting regulated and being used in the context of clinical of psychotherapists that are licensed in a specific training program and under certain circumstances. And this process could take years and years and years and costs millions and millions of dollars. And further, there's a complex ethical and scientific question, endless, that I can also go and talk a lot about it, but perhaps I'll, I'll stop. Save it for next time. <laughs> But I think I think I want to I want to make one last point on that. You know, you talk about this difference between legitimacy and illegitimacy, legal and illegal, and how groups with power and money and influence they often are able to then legalize something. And we're talking about ayahuasca. And as you are well familiar with living or having spent some time in the Bay Area, as I'm familiar with being in New York, a lot of wealthy people drink ayahuasca. A lot of really wealthy people drink ayahuasca. In fact. You know, I was at a tech conference in Berlin about a month ago, and Sergey Brin, who is the co-founder of Google, he's worth about $40 billion, uh, he was asking about Ibogaine because he has a brother who has Parkinson's. And so it's like, there seems for me, like it, there have to be interesting ways where the m movement can be legitimized by taking all this excess financial capital that a lot of people in the tech space have and almost liquidating it into ecological and social capital in the form of legitimizing and legalizing psychedelic substances. So that's kind of like, that's one of my hopes in terms of how do we avoid the overt commercialization of ayahuasca. We basically find people who have had transformative experiences and open up channels of communication with them so they can join the larger community. Because right now there seems to be a distinct lack of relationship between the psychedelic subculture and major financial donors. I know there are some, like Dr. Bronner just gave $5 million to MAPS. There was another article written about this survivor of the Holocaust who's given millions of dollars to MAPS research. I think it was published on Vice or something. But it seems like there's a lot of potential there. And so I guess my hope is maybe there's some way to start opening those lines and channels of communication. Well, this, this brings us a little bit, you know, back to the initial points of this right. conversations, which have to do with the bridges between drug policy and psychedelics. As I said, it is a bridge that needs to be brought. But regarding what you said, I think definitely those alliances have to be made. But we also have to think on ways to reciprocate indigenous peoples and communities from where ayahuasca originates. So I think that each time more and more, it's important that people are engaged in some kind of project that favor the traditional users of these plants. And there's been initiatives in South America, and they are not homogeneous, and they're not totally uh, spread, but there are some good initiatives, which would really should try to mirror them and think on ways that this ayahuasca money could help both in creating more sustainable plantations of ayahuasca and creating inclusivative opportunities for indigenous people and stimulating indigenous rights, things such as indigenous health, indigenous education, indigenous land demarcation, indigenous alliances to fight uh, big transnational and, and foreign money that are not favorable to their communities. So I, I think that a lot of the contemporary movement of ayahuasca should really try to be creating more this kind of positive consequence of globalization instead of just fighting over who is the traditional user and who's not the traditional user, whether this is commodified or not commodified, whether scientific knowledge is bad and traditional native knowledge is good. The way I see it, I am more of a pragmatist. As I said, the genie is out of the bottle. And I think we need to think of harm reduction measures to protect the expansion of ayahuasca. I think that everybody that is like just advocating purely against the expansion of ayahuasca 
is just, you know, going to be preaching the emptiness because it's happening. Whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, there's people brewing thousands and thousands of ayahuasca brew in the Amazon right now to send all over the world. So what are the ways that we can make this growth more organized and organic and balanced? And, and here I just, you know, can't avoid quoting, for example, the initiative of the Ayahuasca Defense Fund, which I work for this project and I have ICRs in high regards that is trying to create some legal protections. As I said, you know, the views that I express here are my own and not the ADFs, but I, I really recommend people to pay attention. We are doing a legal map in the IDF website that we put the status of ayahuasca in each country up. And I'm involved directly in this project as well as in the series of webinars that we promote. And we're just trying to bring really good information and create awareness and create community and create dialogues and get people informed, get them better aware. And like you're going to travel, it's better to avoid having certain legal problems. You're thinking you can't be naive anymore. Today, there is a man, a Brazilian man in jail in Russia, convicted to six and a half years for drinking ayahuasca, for taking four bottles of ayahuasca to Russia. So how can we avoid situations like that? And also, how can we avoid just this flux of tourists that are going to leave a lot of trash behind in the Amazon? So there's different aspects of the discussion need to be addressed. And I think that you know, I'm in favor of science. I'm in favor of advancing scientific knowledge, of creating conferences, of creating debates, of creating forums, and just, you know, sharing information. And that's also what we're trying to do with Kapi and Chakruna. Which we didn't have enough time to talk about, but I'm sure many of our listeners have been to. We always share their content. And we're like, we could keep talking all day, I think, but uh, we've gone about an hour and a half now. So it's been a lot of fun. And it's it's been really interesting Talking with you, we had tried to do this a bit ago and, and got caught up. And I'm glad that we could kind of come back now and, and make this happen. But before we wrap up, do you want to just tell our listeners like where they can find you? So maybe like I know you mentioned your blog, your website, and any of the other projects that you're involved in quick as an overview. Well, I would add in a piece about Chakruna and Kaapi. Kaapi's and Chakruna is, is a project that I co-founded with my dear beloved friend Alex Gearing from Australia. And Kaapi is an online ayahuasca learning hub, and we have courses, we have 11 really amazing courses on science, spirituality, and culture. Each teacher gives three classes of around 10 to 15 minutes. They are videos. They cost really cheap, and we did an amazing investment of time and energy of years in this project, and we're really proud, and I really recommend people to check these sites online. The basic idea is that you you kind of translate scientific knowledge into a more accessible language and not so hermetic, obscure, and hard to understand like science, but also not so superficial and, and empty like social media or journalism frequently can be. And the other point of COP is to really give some kind of practical tips, some wisdom and knowledge from people that do have a lot of empirical experience and scientific experience. And Chakruna is the sister organization of Kaapi, and we're trying to do the same thing there. We also have, we published short articles, and I think our brand is just to have some really good stuff on, like uh, really quality by real academics who really know what they're talking about, who have done real research based on groundwork and we try to, to educate them, to domesticate them, to write papers that people actually read and care. Because the fact is that this academic book, sometimes nobody ever, you know, buys or read, but this post get a lot of visibility. So we're trying to influence debate. And in Chakruna, we're also trying to talk about the backstages of psychedelic science, such as some of the topics that we talked here that do not get a lot of attention so it's an opportunity to talk more directly about things that don't go into peer review publications, but worry all of us. And uh, I also recommend the ADF site. I recommend the site of our conference, Plantas Sagradas in Las Americas. And I recommend my own website. There's the NAPI website. There's Maybe I can give to you a list. And, well, and while we, I have all the lists and I'll make sure we put, like, we'll write up show notes for this. So with any listeners who are just listening to the podcast, your website is bialabate.net. Correct? Yeah. 
B I A L A B A T E dot net. And then we'll provide all the other links, you know, to the ayahuasca defense fund, Chakuna, Kapi, Nepi, anything else? I'm sure there's more. There's so many things. But hey, before I close up, I just want to commend you and, and congratulate you, Paul Austin, for being so, you know, brave. And we shared a little bit of your story and you're such an entrepreneur. And it seems like you're coming with the right place in your heart. And at the same time, your objective about making this, you know, happen and navigate and populate this cyberspace with good stuff and coming, you know, with genuine concerns. And I really admire what you're doing. And I think it's great, you know, that in this younger generation, and sorry to speak like that, I sound like an ant already, but time flies. You have so empty-headed millennials, and you are on the good side of the millennials and the techies, and you're doing really great work, and count on me. Thank you. That's a great way to end. So be a labate, everyone. It was an honor to be able to speak with you for so long and spend time with you. Thanks for listening to the Psychedelia Podcast with Paul Austin. Want more psychedelic information? Go to our website at thethirdwave.co and register for our email list and newsletter. Also, please consider donating to The Third Wave via our Patreon page. Donations make this podcast possible. Psychedelics have the potential to transform lives. By donating, you enable us to continue to inform people about the benefits of these powerful substances.